one of the most extraordinary moments as a parent is when your kids do something you've been teaching and you go, yes, they finally got it. And you have an opportunity to go berserk and just party that that occurred. It's even cooler when your kids catch you doing something right and they brag on you. I remember a couple of years back, my then two-year-old granddaughter, Lelia, who lives in Charlotte, we were together for a week or so, and, and she had a puzzle. She wanted me to work with her, and, and I worked it. And when I finished, she said, good job, Poppy. You did it. I'm proud you. <laughs> and I thought, she's got it. There are a few moments as a pastor also where you just have the extraordinary joy of realizing people are getting it. I've got two of those to brag on you about this morning. Last weekend, we gave our Thanksgiving offering, and a couple of incredible things happened in that service. 25 people committed their lives to Christ. How about that? That's pretty stinking cool. And then we gave together as a church $271,000 as our Thanksgiving offering. So, yeah, that's huge, guys. Go God. So I want to say to you, I proud you. Good job. You did it. Awesome stuff. But there's another extraordinary thing happening at Westside. I believe we are catching the heart of our God for the orphan, for the spiritual orphan who does not yet know the love of Jesus, and for the physical orphan who doesn't even have a home in which they could see that love poured out. And these next three weeks, we're going to be taking on something incredible. We're going to be joining God in that heart in a bigger and bigger way. So we're going to talk today about how do you love somebody that's extraordinary, next week about how do you become somebody that's extraordinary, and then that third week, how do you share someone that's extraordinary? And then we're going to have, we believe, the most extraordinary worship time ever celebrating the birthday of Jesus in our 22nd, 23rd, 24th services. Here's the flow for today. In just a moment, Matt Adams, our pastor for Community Impact, is going to start us off. And then Sue Ann, one of our champions from South Africa, you are going to love her. She's here today and going to share her heart. And then I'll be back to wrap it up. It's going to be an extraordinary day as we talk about what God wants us to continue to do and to grow in doing around the world. How about a hand for Matt Adams as he comes to kick it off? Thank you. 87 nights in a shack. That's where we stand. 87 nights. In two weeks... In two weeks, our pastors will have spent 100 nights in a shack, and we'll have something to celebrate. No more shack. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. It's been, a, it's been a great experience spending the night in the shack. It's been kind of cool. <laughs> Literally, really, it has been kind of cool lately. And uh, but Pastor Sean and I came up with this idea back in August because we wanted in some way to demonstrate that the majority of the world doesn't live the way you and I live. In fact, that shack out there is actually built better than what most people live in, most families live in. So we did this to, to point this out, that we are blessed to be a blessing. We set up a Facebook page and a webcam and a website because we wanted to get the word out that we believe God wants to do something extraordinary through Westside, and you guys have responded in amazing ways. I mean... You have taken this 100 nights thing and made it personal. Some of you are giving up meat or candy or vegetables. <laughs> uh, I heard one kid wanted to give up schoolwork for 100 days. Well, <laughs> but many of you have given up things like Pastor Sean's gone without shoes for 100 nights. He's in South Africa right now where it is summer, and I know he's praising God every moment of that time. <laughs> but he comes back tomorrow, so... Seriously, it's been great. We did this all hoping to gear up that in two weeks, on December 18th, we might celebrate truly something extraordinary that together you and I might that day pledge $1 million to fight for victims of poverty and injustice around the world. And wouldn't that be amazing? So we're looking forward to that day. It's going to be a great day. And we, we, uh, we, we wanted to do something extraordinary, and so we called this message extraordinary because of that hope. If you look in your uh, notes, you'll see that the big idea for today's message is, is, is a very powerful but very simple truth that God does extraordinary things 
through ordinary people. And the series comes from the book of Acts. The, the, the theme, the focus verse is actually Acts 4.13, where we find Peter and John who have been arrested by the same council of men who had Jesus arrested and later crucified, and they've been arrested for continuing to preach about this man Jesus. And so they're, they're before this council, and here's the response to this council of men when they sit down and talk with Peter and John. Here's what they say. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Now let me paraphrase that for you. When they realized that these guys were just common laborers, they were probably high school dropouts, they had no great education, nothing to set them apart from the rest of ordinary men of the world of that time. They realized that these men had great courage and a powerful message because of the Jesus they had been around. Jesus made a difference in their lives, a huge difference. Peter and John were extraordinary because they had a profound love for Jesus. They simply would not stop talking about him. And it made them stand out. And so the big idea for today's message is this. To be extraordinary, you must love someone extraordinary. Now I want you to follow with me in your notes. We're going to dig into just a portion of the first chapter of the book of Colossians. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open those up because you may want to make little notes in the margin as we go along. But we're going to look together at Colossians chapter 1, beginning with verse 15, read just a few verses. And I want you, as I read aloud, I want you to kind of take note in your mind, what are some of the extraordinary characteristics that Paul points out about Jesus in this passage? And then we're going to pull a few of them out together, okay? Here we go. Colossians 1 verse 15 says this, the Son is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross." Now, the first thing I want to draw out of that passage is that Jesus is extraordinary because he is the revelation of God. He is the full revelation of God. Now, I, I'm a dad. I have two daughters. And I'm the main revelation of what a father is to my two girls. And I'll tell you that some days that's a mighty sad revelation. You ought to pray for my two girls. You really should. The, the, the Bible tells us here that Jesus is the full revelation of God, not, not the partial revelation. Paul tells us that God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the full revelation of God. Then secondly, Jesus is extraordinary because he is the creator and the sustainer of everything. In verse 16, he says, In him all things were created, and later all things have been created through him and for him. And then it says, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, I want to I point something out to you, that there is a great lie in our culture that you and I have grown up believing and even, even, even proclaiming in many, in many venues. It's this lie that there is some things, there are some things that are sacred, and there are some things that are secular. And here's the lie. There is nothing that is not sacred. Jesus Christ is the creator and the sustainer of everything. There is nothing that we can say, oh, this is not under Jesus' domain. Yes, it is. Everything. 
is under the domain of Jesus Christ. Everything is under his rule. He has authority over everything. Everything is sacred. The second thing, the third thing, Jesus is extraordinary because he has supreme authority. That, that's really a great follow-up to that that he creates and sustains. He has supreme authority. We're told in verses 15 and 18 that Jesus has authority over the church. He's where we draw our mission. He is why we exist. We exist as a church to love Jesus, become like Jesus, and share Jesus. He gives us our direction as a church. He is what we do as a church, talking to people about Jesus, proclaiming Jesus. He is also the authority over creation. And by the cross and the crucifixion and the resurrection, we know that Jesus is also authority over life and death itself. Jesus is the supreme authority. He's Lord of all. Jesus is, then fourthly, he is the reconciler of all things to himself. Through his blood shed on the cross, Jesus Christ made it possible that the world might be made right again. Now, I, I, I think you'll agree with me when I tell you that I believe that we live in a broken, messed up world. This is not the world as God designed it to be. This is this is a world broken by sin, where you find broken relationships and people hurting each other and people refusing to acknowledge the Creator, instead worshiping the creation. This is a broken world. But through Jesus Christ, God has made a way that all the world might be set right again, might be reconciled to Him. And I don't know about you, but that gives me great hope, because I believe in the promise of God that he will restore, he will reconcile the world to himself someday, fully. And then I want you to jump down to, in Colossians 1, down to verse 27, and look with me at this amazing verse. Because we've looked at four ways that Jesus is extraordinary, I want you to see just a foreshadowing of how you and I might be extraordinary through him. In verse 27 it says this, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This same extraordinary Jesus, for reasons that are way beyond my comprehension, this same extraordinary Jesus has chosen to make himself known in and through you and me. Now, I want you to stop just for a moment, and I want you to think about someone you know who is so in love with Jesus, who, who, who loves Jesus so much that when you're around them, you just, you just sense the presence of Jesus. Can you think of someone? I imagine you can, because there are people all over our, 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 our family that, that, that are like that. People who just love Jesus, that they're just soaked in Jesus, and they... And they love Jesus, and it just comes out of them. It just overflows from them. Well, I want to introduce you to one young lady who is one of our ministry partners through Impact in South Africa. She's an amazing young lady. She's 24 years old, but has a profound love for Jesus. Her name is Suanne de Toy, and she's going to come and share with us just a little bit about what she does. Suanne, welcome her, would you please? It is great to see you, and thank you for coming all the way from South Africa just to talk to me. Really appreciate it. Actually, Sue Ann's here for three weeks, mm -hmm. and she'll be in the commons later. As we'll, 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 uh, you'll get to talk to her. But she is an amazing young lady. Let me just tell you just a little bit about Sue Ann. Sue Ann is four feet something. Actually, just under five feet. She prefers <laughs> me to say it that way. And uh, she grew up in a middle-class home in South Africa where her parents were were believers in Christ and showed you the love of Christ. But Sue Ann, what I'd like you to start off with is just telling us a bit about what you do, because what you do is really extraordinary. Good morning. I um, have the great opportunity of working for an organization called Oceans of Mercy. Um, some of you, <laughs> sorry, some of you might have heard of them before. And what we do is we have various projects um, through which we serve orphaned and vulnerable kids. Um, 
And in South Africa, there are very many of them, um, thousands upon thousands of kids who need to be loved and looked after. And so um, through the programs that we run, we have the opportunity to work with local people who have a heart for these kids who normally try and do it on their own before we even get there. And then we partner with them to show the children something of the love of Christ, um, to introduce them to love as many of them don't experience it. Many of them are not, um, they don't even have families. Maybe they have a grandmother or grandfather who looks after them somewhere. Um, and so through our programs, our soup clubs, our child sponsorship programs, we have the opportunity of introducing these kids to the love of Christ so that later in their lives, um, when, it, when the time comes for them to choose God, they have something to refer to. They have an idea, an understanding of love that they would not have had otherwise. I know that most of us are not aware that uh, South Africa particularly has been ravaged by HIV AIDS. And so the reality, I mean, because I, I know from my experience there, going to the, one of the great cemeteries in, uh, is it? Madawa. Yeah. Madawa. Uh, that there are, there's an entire generation that's gone. So uh, if you look for a parent, there, I mean, almost, there are almost no parents among this, uh, the poorest generation, the poorest of, the, of South Africa, because they've all died because of AIDS. So many, many, many orphans. And so you've identified working with these mamas uh, a way you can care for literally a couple thousand orphans. And we have the opportunity to provide a purpose for those mamas. A lot of them have the heart and the love to do it, but they, um, they need the encouragement. Mm. So we actually, through the work that we do, we have the opportunity to not only uplift the children, but the entire community. One of the areas of South Africa that we got to see when I was there in January was uh, an area called the Transkei. And I know it's a place that's very dear to your heart, although you didn't grow up there. No. So tell us about the Transkei. Why does it you love so much about the Transkei? I will do my best to explain to you this little piece of heaven. Um, it is the most, most beautiful place on earth. Um, and what I love most about it is how untouched it is. Um, there are these great rolling hills um, in summertime, which is the rainy season. They are emerald green. They're beautiful. And then in wintertime, they're about a, like a hay color. Um, but they just stretch on as far as the eye can see. Um, you have great co coastal forests. It's right, um, the, the Transkei province will area um, is along the coast, so there are beautiful beaches. Um, so you actually, when you're there, you get to experience God in, in his creation. It's untouched by man. You don't see any skyscrapers. <laughs> I mean, if you see a brick building, it's impressive. Um, and the, the other thing that I really, really love about Transkei is the people. They are beautiful, the most beautiful people you'll ever see. They are so open and loving and accepting. Um, they, they live in community with each other, so they all know each other's kids. They look after each other's kids. Little two to four-year-olds walk around in the community completely on their own. No parental supervision, which I do not approve of. But, um, <laughs> but yet, everyone knows the kids. Everyone knows... Um, whose child it is, and so they all um, work together to, to make it work. Um, just they're, they're just beautiful. They're just absolutely beautiful. They're not spoilt like us Westerners. Mm. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't prep you with this, but I remember Sean talking about how the trans guy had been a place that during apartheid was basically uh, oppressed by the government, or at least left not supported and so it's amazing to me to hear you talk that this place that had been undeveloped by men is, in your words, just a piece of heaven on earth. It's just a beautiful place, although there is extreme poverty there. Um, despite all the beauty of the Transkei, um, it re really is a very sad place. 
Um, we've lost our middle generation. Um, mainly, the main cause would be HIV. We also have other other issues. Cancer is a big problem we have, and just general um, malnutrition, violence. We suffer from a lot of crime and violence. Um, so despite how beautiful it is, it is actually a very sad place. We have, I'd say, maybe eight out of 10 kids would be orphaned. Um, grandmothers or grandparents, oh, actually I would even go as far as saying grandmothers look after them. Um, men are completely missing. We, um, we don't see any men, we don't see any good fathers. Um, and then for two main reasons, HIV and um, there is no real work opportunities in the trans guys. So most of the men um, are migrant laborers. And a lot of them have two families or a girlfriend in town and then a home. So they don't look after their families. Um, you know, there's just, there's a great sadness there, a great need for love and for care. Um, despite the fact that they live in community, they do look after each other. We suffer from, a, the children are abused and neglected. And then there's a lack of resources as well. Even the people, like I said, the mamas who want to help and who want to look after the kids, they, they lack the resources to do it. Well, I know this has stirred a lot of thoughts in your own mind. You probably have questions for Zuan. But before you go, I want to ask you to do just two things. Once you first tell us what role does Jesus play in what you do, and then anything else you'd like Westsiders to know. OK? Oh. <clears throat> The question is, what role do I play in what Jesus does? Oh, I love that. <laughs> I wish we'd... Per that was great. Go, good, good job. I remember that. Um, I, I grew up, like you said, in a middle-class family. Um, I was very blessed to have parents who loved Christ and introduced me to that love. Um, and I've, I guess I grew up with an appreciation of having a family that cares for me and and lives for Christ. Um, and in my walk with Jesus, he's shown me what a great need there is for that. Um, and not only with poor people, like everyone, everyone needs Christ. And so many of us don't experience him, don't have a relationship with him. And as in my walk with Christ, he kept introducing me to the fact that people just need Christ's love. That's the answer to all the issues in the world. And um, so Christ provides me with a message of hope, um, and he enables me to spread that message. Um, so when we work with the children and the people, that anyone that we work with, we actually have the opportunity of providing real hope. Um, a lot of NGOs do great work, but they, they, don't, they don't have anything to offer that's... that's forever. Um, and so we have the opportunity to really, through Christ, bring hope and joy and, and purpose to the lives of children who would not otherwise have that. You can give them a full belly, but they're still, they're still cold when they go to sleep. They still don't have parents. They still, many of them don't even have a dream for a future. So that's what I love about Christ, is that he is just spectacular. <laughs> As far as a message to everyone, I don't know that I'm fit to be providing messages. <laughs> but I would say um, I would never in my life have um, believed the things that I hear people saying of me. <laughs> you must be talking about someone else. Um, and I, what Christ did for me was to show me that in everyone and in everything, he is alive. Everything is an expression of him. And so if you, and I struggle with this, but I try in the mornings when I wake up to say, just show me Christ today. And so in everyone that I meet or in everything that I see, I try and identify that little, that little piece of God that, that's in there. And that really helps you appreciate and belong. It gives you a feeling of belonging and purpose. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I know uh, we have another guest from South Africa with us. Her name is Kolewa. Is that right? Did they say that right? Um, 
not, <laughs> not, not right. No, it's close. It's not right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try, but I'll probably also get it wrong. Uh, but it's kolelwa. Yeah, you got to get that click in there. Like that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm I'm clickless, but <laughs> but uh, kolelwa and 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 Sue Ann will be in the Commons, so we invite you to come by and see them between services this morning. So thank you so much. Thank you. I want, in just, the, in just the last few minutes, I want to draw your attention to another passage of Scripture we're going to camp on just for a minute or two. John chapter 1. Now, in John chapter 1, some of the same themes about Christ are repeated. I want to focus for just a moment on verse 14. Jesus is the creator, John says. Jesus is the sustainer of all things. Jesus is God. He is God with us. And then in John 14, it says, the word Jesus, he says, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And he says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And what I'd like you to do in your notes, if you haven't already done it, I want you to circle or underline that phrase, made his dwelling among us. Now, the word in Greek would be literally translated tabernacled or camped out or pitched his tent. And it would have brought to mind, for the people who are reading this for the, for the first time in, when it was written, it would have brought to mind the word tabernacle because tabernacle was a significant part of Israel's history. When Israel was released from slavery in Egypt during the period of the Exodus, God instructed his people to build a tabernacle, a tent that would be his dwelling place among them. God tabernacled, he camped out, he dwelt among his people. And later when Israel settled in, in Jerusalem as their capital, they built a temple in, in the city of Jerusalem that was a majestic, beautiful building where God himself dwelt. The temple replaced the tabernacle. It was the dwelling place of God. Now you and I, we would, we would look at the temple, it's not there anymore, it was destroyed many years ago, but we would look at the temple and we would say, wow, that's an amazing building. It was, it was one of the most significant architectural features of, of that era. It was amazing. It was extraordinary. It was a beautiful building. The sun would have shined on it and reflected and you could not ignore the temple. It was spectacular. Wow, that is so cool. But to the Jewish people, it was so much more. It was the symbol, the actual presence of God among them. It was the dwelling place of God. Now, when you and I think of heaven and earth, we think of heaven as somewhere up there and earth is down here. And they're greatly separated by, by some distance. But for the Jewish people, that was not the case. When they thought of heaven and earth, they realized that the temple was the place where heaven met earth. It was the place where heaven and earth literally connected. It was where heaven and earth came together. It was the place where heaven met earth. That's in your notes, so fill that in. It was, it was a significant spot. It was, it was just so profound that not only was there a God a God supreme, a God of the universe, but this same God lived among us, and he lived in the temple. Now listen, this is important for you to get, because in the temple, there was a curtain that separated the Holy of Holies, the dwelling place of God, from the rest of the, of the temple. And the, only the high priest, and only once a year could he go in to commune with God, to talk with God, to hear from God. But when Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross... The Bible tells us that God himself tore the temple from top to bottom and the act of Christ being crucified separate, uh, removed that separation from God and from his people so that suddenly God had no barriers. Mankind had no barriers because God had removed them and suddenly we could have a personal connection with God through Jesus Christ. Now, let me tell you why that's really, really extraordinary. 
When you and I accept Christ as our Savior and Lord, as more than 25 of you did last week, the Bible tells us that His Spirit comes to live in us. Did you get that? I know you said it before, but did you really get that? You know what that means? Paul tells us in Corinthians that we are the temple of God. That through the power of Jesus Christ, when we accept him as our Lord and Savior, he comes to live in us, and we become the temple of God. The Almighty God, the God of the universe, comes to live in us. And suddenly, you and I become the place where heaven meets earth. Now, when I first thought of that, I thought, wow, that gives me chills. Somehow in this broken world, through the power of Jesus Christ, I can, I can show someone who's broken the wholeness of Christ. I can show them that they can be reconciled with God through the power of Christ because Christ is in me, and suddenly I can be extraordinary. Write that down. Through Jesus, you become extraordinary. I don't know anyone who would want to be ordinary when you can be extraordinary through Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, I ask that you would help us to see in, in the most intimate and personal way how your spirit, the power of Jesus Christ, can come and live in us and dwell in us, and we can in some way be the meeting place of heaven and earth for this broken world. Father, I, I give you the glory and pray you would help us to realize that. In Jesus' name, amen. How about a hand for Matt and Sue Mann? Awesome. What an amazing thought that God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things through them. I want to highlight two opportunities for you. Can I borrow that brochure you've got since I left mine right over there? Thank you so much. Two things that we have an opportunity to do. One is, is on the Christmas Eve services, I hope you will invite somebody. People have been asking us already, do you need us to come to a particular service? Are you anticipating one service will be fuller than the other? Here's the service we want you to come to, the one that the friend you've invited can most easily come to. Wouldn't it be an extraordinary thing if you brought somebody here, an unchurched friend, somebody who doesn't yet know Jesus Christ, and through that great celebration of his birthday, they'd come to know him. Bring a friend and expect God to use you in an extraordinary way. But there's a second extraordinary thing we're taking on at Westside right now. I invite you to read this later through the week. Now, I understand the folks who came in one door got these and the other door didn't. If you didn't get one, they'll be at the table as you exit. You can pick one up. Westside is becoming a church who wants more and more to do things way beyond ourselves, way beyond our own community right here in southwest Kansas City. It's the reason we're working with spiritual and physical orphans in KCK, in South Africa, where Sue, Sue Ann and Koelua, did I get close? They're laughing. She's laughing over there. No, I didn't even get close. Where they are from and, and in Thailand, and God just keep opening these doors for us to do things beyond ourselves. In 2009, we gave $300,000 to causes beyond ourselves, and that was awesome. In 2010, it was 600000 This year, 2011, if you continue to give the rate you are, it'll be over 700000 That is amazing stuff. We're getting crazy. Are you ready? Our goal is a $1 million in 2012. That will be more than 20% of everything that ever comes in here going back out to take care of the spiritual and physical orphans of the world. Why is that a big deal? I have been to the trans sky. And if I walk in or we go in as a team of Westsiders and say there's a God that's in charge of the whole universe and he loves you and he especially cares about your orphan children, God bless you and we leave, 
they're saying, if your God cares about our kids, why didn't you do something for our kids? But when we do soup kitchens and feed them, when we build community centers and educate them, when we put up orphanages and house them, and then say, our God cares about your kids, they're going, we believe it. We've seen how you care about these kids. Million dollars. Here's our goal. Number one, that you'd understand this is not the substitute for your regular giving. The goal is not just take what you're already given to Westside and move it over. We're tithers at Westside. We believe that we give here first. But it is that you'd give over and beyond. What could you give up to keep giving in a bigger and bigger way in 2012? And here's the second goal. We hope everybody participates, even if it's at a minimal level. What a great way for a 10-year-old to learn. If they get an allowance, they can give to this would it be cool for them to be part of what God is doing? A million dollars. We're going to pledge that on December 18th. We're not giving it on December 18th. We're not asking you, hey, you just gave Thanksgiving to make a big gift in a couple of weeks. We're asking you to pledge what you can do. It's the last page in this brochure. There's a pledge card. We'll be talking more. Here's my hope. My hope is that when we pledge together on 2018, Everyone who pledges, and I hope that's all of us, will hear your Father in heaven say, Good job. You did it. I proud you. Because we are catching the heart of God at Westside. Let's pray together. Jesus, would you please continue to stretch our heart beyond ourselves? Help us to love you. You are extraordinary and help you and your presence to become even more real in and through us in this season. That's our prayer in Christ. Amen.